You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Steve Desch. Steve Desch is a professor of astrophysics in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at ASU. His research focuses on developing models of star and planet formation using data from meteoritics and planetary science. He especially studies the origins of chondrules and meteorites. He also works in the fields of exoplanets and astrobiology and is principal investigator of the NASA-funded Nexus Grant to study geochemical cycles on exoplanets to aid searchers for signs of life on other planets. Asteroid 9926-Dash is named after him. Steve Dash, welcome to the program. Me. Now, Doctor, you work with the formation of the solar system, the very earliest history of what would become Earth, the sun, the planets, everything like that. And you come at it from the position of meteorites, which can be very pristine time capsules, as it were, giving us an insight into that. So with the very most primitive meteorites that aren't subject to shock and all the sort of things that happen to them, what does that tell us about the age of the solar system and exactly how everything came to be? Great. Yeah, I really enjoy using meteoritic data to constrain models of how the solar system formed. Uh, my PhD was in physics. I did a lot of numerical models of very astrophysical nature. And then somebody at some point said that these magnetic fields I was predicting existed in the early solar system. They're recorded by these rocks you can hold in your hand. And it blew my mind. And ever since then, I've tried to bridge those two fields. One of the other things meteorites do is they record the time of their formation, if you know how to ask them nicely. And they do this by isotopic abundances. So different radioactive elements decay over different time scales into different isotopes. And one of the most important ones, systems, is the uranium lead system. So there are two isotopes of uranium that are fairly abundant, 235, 238, and each of them decays to a different isotope of lead. So if you measure the ratios of lead isotopes and you measure the uranium composition, you can infer how long ago the object formed, the whatever piece of uh, meteorite you're looking at, an inclusion, we call them, you can ask when did that inclusion form? Or to be more precise, when did the lead isotopes in that inclusion stop moving around? But with that, we know that our solar system is roughly four and a half billion years old. In fact, depending on how you define the system, we can actually pin it down to 4,568.4 million years old. The uranium isotopes decaying into lead. So you mentioned lead moving around. So you can actually determine after the decay into lead, you can still gain even more information from it. Right. What the uranium lead system tells you is how long ago the lead isotopes that partly some lead was there, partly some lead was created by the decay of uranium. But as long as they're moving around, they're mobile, they can jump from one point in a crystal to another. As long as they're doing that, it's not possible to, to use these isotopic ratios to, to date things. But once they calm down and they stay in place, that's when you start the clock, if you will. We call that isotopic closure. And usually you need the crystal or the minerals that lead and uranium isotopes are in to cool down below a critical temperature. It's usually a pretty high temperature, but what you're actually dating is when did the mineral not just form, but cool below a certain temperature. Now with meteorites, one of the key features of the geology of these is, or at least uh, stone meteorites, is the chondral, which appears to be, they're basically small spheres that make up the matrix of the meteorite. So what are the origin of these and what do they tell us about the conditions of during the formation of the solar system? Right. So in the most primitive meteorites, which we call chondrites, these are chunks of rock from asteroids that did not melt. There are a lot of iron meteorites and melted stony meteorites, but chondrites are the ones that contain things that existed in the solar nebula. And the main thing they contain is chondrules. 
which are these, as he said, little melted spherules of rock with less than a millimeter in size. Another thing that a lot of chondrites include is something called uh, CAIs. That stands for calcium-rich, aluminum-rich inclusions. And they're not as common as chondrules, but they formed, we think, at an earlier time. And it is one of the big mysteries, what event melted chondrules. You know, you're talking about most of the mass of asteroids melted before it went into forming an asteroid while it was floating through space. It was melted one grain of sand at a time. What melted that and when did those get melted? And we can look at both chondrules and CAIs and we can use this uranium lead dating to figure out when those events occurred. And a major question is whether they occurred at different times or a few million years apart. Interesting. Any candidates to explain the melting? I mean, could the protoplanetary disk with the young sun get that hot in, in order to do that? Or is that just off the table? Yeah, these are really excellent questions and uh, have motivated quite a lot of research, including a lot that I've worked on. Uh, whatever melted all of those chondrules had to be a, a major thing in the solar nebula. We definitely feel that the CAIs, which seem to have formed first, these had to have formed in a nebula that was very hot. And it would have been hot enough to, to melt and vaporize rock very early on as all this material collapsed from the molecular cloud to form a star, to form a disk of material. So it makes sense that CAIs would have formed at that time. But chondrules, they seem to have been melted in a very transient way. Like they got to these temperatures, but only for a few hours at a time. And uh, discerning what could have melted a large portion of the nebula, but only a little bit at a time for hours at a time. That's the mystery. One of the main theories that the one I ascribe to is the melting of rocks as they went through a bow shock around kind of newly formed planets. So if you have a Mars sized planet and it gets scattered into an eccentric orbit, maybe you got a gravitational tug from a growing Jupiter, then it would have been moving through the gas at supersonic speeds and there would have been a shock wave in front of it any dust particles that went through this shock wave would have been melted to you know reach the temperatures needed to melt rock and would only have done so for a few hours at a time and on a lot of levels this seems to match the data that we have for how chondrules melted now that's interesting and very mysterious actually so if you look at other protoplanetary disks in the Milky Way, where there's active planet formation going on right now, or at least from our perspective, is there any hope of answering that question by studying those systems? Yeah, you know, we think that the processes that exist in our solar system should be pretty universal. But then once we start talking about Jupiters, then we worry that they might not be so universal because although our solar system has a Jupiter at about five Earth sun distances from the sun, it doesn't seem like that's the norm in other solar systems. As we've discovered exoplanets, it seems like maybe only 5%, maybe 10% of solar systems have a Jupiter where our Jupiter is. So, so it's a really open question whether the things that happen in our solar system are universal. But we are starting to get better detail about what's going on in these disks of gas and dust around which other planets are forming around other stars, mostly through the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. And it should be possible to see whether you have spiral arms in these disks or hopefully even shock waves around planets that are currently on eccentric orbits. So we haven't really gotten the necessary data yet, but it seems as if in the near future we will and be able to test whether chondral formation by passage through bow shocks around planetesimals or planetary embryos on eccentric orbits, whether that's something that happened in other solar systems too. A protoplanetary disk does not seem like a very pleasant place to be. Astrobiologically speaking, is astrobiology question, does the presence of Jupiter seem to actually favor life or does it even matter? Or is it just something that, that is but doesn't affect the chances for life? In other words, with Jupiter's ability to affect planetary migration and things like that, has anybody ever thought of any way that that could have been conducive to a biogenesis on Earth? 
This is a great question. How much of an effect did Jupiter have on our disk and the delivery of materials to the growing Earth? And how much effect did it have after Earth form? We tend to think that Jupiter has shielded the Earth from a lot of impacts after it formed, but it also had a lot of bearing on how Earth formed in the first place and what chemicals it accreted. One of the things we're really only in the last decade piecing together is that Jupiter seems to have formed very early in our solar system and it seems to have blocked the inflow of very uh, volatile rich material. So a lot of material with a lot of carbon and nitrogen and other elements needed for life maybe could not make its way into the inner solar system where Earth was forming because Jupiter had formed and blocked that entry. So without a Jupiter, what would it be like? Probably we'd have a lot more life bearing elements on the surface, but possibly there'd be more impacts after it formed. And it's uh, it's hard to know what what the outcome would be. That brings up an interesting thought. If if more, assuming the, the amount of chemistry, if you have more of it, say organic chemistry, more of it, that maybe Earth wasn't as favored as some exoplanets out there might be if they don't have the same situation with Jupiter, but have it in some other way, maybe a multiple planet system that, that serves the same function. I think that's possible. It's certainly possible that if you were to play the movie again and you change a few variables, you'd have very different Earth. This is one of the things that uh, the group that I lead here to study exoplanet chemistry, we're trying to discern what are the possible outcomes and how much, uh, you know, how different could the chemistry be and what effect would that have on life? One of the more paradoxical findings that our group at ASU has come up with so far is that if you can observe water on the surface of a planet, of a rocky exoplanet like Earth, you probably have more water on that planet than you want to see if you're looking for life. And the short reason for that is simply that if you can observe and uh, you know determine that there's water on the surface of a planet right now, it's because there's enough water to change the mass radius relationship, the density of the planet. So if you can tell that there's water on the surface of a planet, it probably has 10 times as much water as Earth does, at least. And this would pertain to maybe some of the planets we've observed around the, the star TRAPPIST-1. We, we think that they have considerably more water than the Earth does, even though they're sort of Earth mass, they're, they're much lower in density. Well, if you have that much water on the surface, you don't have exposed continents and you do not have land and you don't have rainfall on land that is weathering rock and releasing important chemicals like phosphorus. So it matters quite a lot how much of, of each of these uh, volatile elements you have, you know, water, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, all these elements you need for life, but it sometimes matters in very subtle ways. That's an interesting idea that the presence of water, the, the very most basic solvent of life, you can have too much and it can prevent life as well. Yeah, yeah, it could. And it could lead to, it, it may be possible that life would exist in oceans, these very, 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 very deep oceans around these planets. But one of the more complicated things is that it might exist at such a low level that it could not generate oxygen at a rate that we could be sure the oxygen we'd see in the atmosphere is coming from life. And this matters for how we design telescopic missions to look for biosignatures around rocky exoplanets. That's somewhat limiting, right? So if you have methanogenic bacteria that aren't producing any oxygen, there's no photosynthesis there, then it's it's indistinguishable from a natural situation or a non-life situation rather. Yeah, on Earth, we have oxygen in our atmosphere at a very high abundance, 21%, because life is producing it so quickly. And so the game plan among some of these large NASA missions planned for the future, these space telescopes to look for life, is to look for the absorption of starlight by oxygen gas in the planet that's transiting its star. But yeah, if you have oxygen in the atmosphere, but it's produced at a very low level, 
then you can't be sure that the oxygen you see is being produced by life at a very low level, or if maybe it's just abiotic processes like photolysis, water vapor gets into the upper atmosphere, UV light from the star breaks it apart, the hydrogen escapes, the oxygen remains. That's a, that's a way to make oxygen. On Earth, it's Life makes oxygen a thousand times faster than that. And so we're pretty sure the oxygen we see is not due to processes like that. But, but if you have a planet that could only support life at a, at a level uh, where photosynthesis was happening at a rate one thousandth of what we have on Earth, then you'd always be questioning whether what you see is oxygen due to life or oxygen due to abiotic photolysis. And you don't want to look for, plant, look for life around planets that are going to be like that. You'll always have inconclusive results. So this tells us how to design missions and what planets to look for life around. Now, what about a profile of gases? So you see oxygen, but it's a little ambiguous. But are there other possibilities that you could look for, like phosphine or methane levels and things like that that could go with it to support a case for having discovered a biosphere? Yeah, absolutely. Methane is another really strong candidate. The methane in Earth's atmosphere is also produced by life, by methanogens. And so when we see methane in Earth's atmosphere, and methane is destroyed by a combination of oxygen and also photolysis, when we see methane, we're pretty sure that it has to be life because the abiotic processes to produce methane, which involves water reacting with rock in uh, the deep earth, uh, a process called serpentinization, that can also produce methane, but it does so at a rate that's much smaller than Earth. So methane is a good compound to look for as well, but the combination of methane and oxygen is especially suggestive because they don't usually exist in equilibrium with each other. So yeah, this is the plan to look for these sorts of compounds in the atmospheres of exoplanets and, uh, but we have to understand how geochemical cycles work on these exoplanets, especially when they have chemistries very different from Earth. Yes, which there seems to be a lot of possibilities for variation in that. Now, as we move forward, of course, we'll, we're beginning to have the capability of characterizing atmospheres of exoplanets, or at least some of them. But what about the surfaces of exoplanets? What can we tell from a distance and say a future telescope, something really big, what can we tell about the actual surfaces of of these worlds? Yeah, the, the atmospheres are a little easier because we can just use the starlight and see what's absorbed. We are beginning to learn more about the surfaces. Uh, one thing that is currently done is to look for infrared emission from planets, and especially as they are in front of their stars, on the side of the stars, go behind the stars. And from this, we've, we've learned about the heat budget on a few planets, and we know that certain exoplanets are warmer on their nighttime sides than you might have predicted, for example. And this tells us that heat is being transported from the day side to the night side, almost certainly by winds and atmospheres. So we're beginning to learn about the atmospheres quite a lot. The next steps are to characterize the surfaces, and it's hoped that we should be able to tell something broadly about whether you're looking at land or water or whether you're looking at clouds. That seems achievable in the next decades with the next generation of telescopes. And also the search for uh, glint, where you're looking for a, an especially bright signature of uh, sunlight or starlight uh, reflecting in a in a certain way off of a very reflective surface and looking for that signature would tell you that there's probably a liquid surface on the planet. So these are the next steps with the next generation of telescopes. And by virtue of the position of the planet, you could probably tell that that liquid is most likely water, but there are other possibilities, right? What about ammonia? There certainly could be other liquids that would reflect light. And it's interesting that this glint observation has actually been done for one planet, a planet in our own solar system, or a moon, if you will, of Saturn, and that is Titan. So Titan has methane liquid on its surface, so lakes of liquid methane. And it has been the uh, glint off of these lakes that has been detected by the Cassini spacecraft as it flew by Titan. 
Yes, I remember the spectacular pictures, but it had, it had always been hypothesized that we would see that and that there would be liquid hydrocarbons on Titan. But to actually see it and see the sunlight glinting off it was one of the highlights of that mission, I think. Yeah. When you're looking at an exoplanet, okay, say a distant one, you're able to characterize a little bit about its atmosphere and a little bit about its surface, but are there any specific bio tech or techno signatures that we could look at? Now, I know about one, the vegetative red edge that's been suggested for detecting plants, but who knows if what an alien plant cell looks like. But the question is, is our, our, where do we go from there? Say we have a good candidate. How do we characterize it further as far as what kind of life is there? And what would we look for if we were saying, well, maybe there's a civilization in there. We should look. Right. So... It's easier to know what to look for with simple life. And you, you raise the, the red edge, which is a really interesting phenomenon. When we look at Earth, we see that plants, uh, the chlorophyll they use, they tend to use the high energy photons that they need to initiate the uh, photosynthesis reaction, but they, they don't want to absorb too much light that isn't useful to them. It just heats up the plant and that is not beneficial to it. So it tends to be very reflective at long wavelengths and uh, absorb the short wavelengths. And that leads to a very abrupt change in the reflection properties of plants on Earth, at a particular wavelength. And it's such an abrupt change that it looks like, an, like a very edge in the albedo as a function of wavelength, the reflectiveness as a function of wavelength. And uh, it's in the red, so they call it the red edge. And because it's based on these sort of simple physics, you need the high energy photons to do the chemistry and you need to not absorb the low energy ones so you don't get too hot. Uh, we think that this is probably a sort of universal thing to look for in uh, any sort of photosynthesizing life. Boy, we sure get into more complicated questions and, and a lot more uncertainty as we start to think about more complex life and especially techno signatures. So uh, I'm not an expert myself on techno signatures. Of course, SETI has thought long and hard about this and, you know, what sort of radio emissions should we look for? Or maybe we shouldn't look for radio emissions because any civilization that's been around more than 10 years has switched to cable or direct laser point to point communication. Or maybe they would have done something else involving it's, it, you go down a, a rabbit hole trying to figure out what's the most efficient way to transmit information. It's hoped that universal laws apply there still, that uh, any civilization will want to communicate using the least amount of energy, but get the most signal to noise out of their transmissions. But beyond that, it's, it's really hard to say. Now, back to you, meteorites and the origin of the solar system. We also have very distant objects that at least some of them appear to be very pristine that we see with uh, comets and the meteorites associated with them, but Kuiper Belt objects, and in particularly one really strange example, the object Haumea. Tell us about that strange object. Yeah, Haumea is one of my favorite Kuiper Belt objects. It's not quite the largest, although it's pretty large. The mean radius is about 750 kilometers, and this compares to to Pluto, you know, it's about 1,200. And so it's it's definitely in the top 10 Kuiper Belt objects in terms of mass or size. What's There are many weird things about it, actually. One is that it is spinning very fast, every 3.9 hours. There's nothing else in the solar system that large that is spinning that fast. It's also completely covered in water ice. There's no evidence of anything else on its surface at more than the percent level. It's, it's something like 97%, at least, pure water ice. It has two moons that also appear to be pure ice that orbit it, uh, Hi'iaka and Namaka. And it has a ring that was discovered about six years ago. And there are a collection of small um, Kuiper Belt objects that orbit the sun with the same sort of orbit, same semi-major axis and eccentricity and inclination as Haumea itself. And so th this is a huge mystery, and especially since we don't see any other Kuiper Belt objects that are just pure water ice around them. And so the story has 
had been when it, when it was discovered that a large collision uh, uh, struck it and stripped off a lot of the ice from it, but left a little bit of ice and knocked off fragments that then orbited the sun. We do see families of objects in the asteroid belt orbit the sun in similar fashion, and that's inferred to be because a collision knocked them out into orbits around the sun that were similar to the main body. But as time has gone on, we've actually developed a, a much more complicated story for Haumea. And what's that? So it would seem to me that out in the Kuiper belt, it, it, things are going to be fairly, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of space in between. So it seems to me to be less likely that you would have impacts between objects out there that far. Or is it a situation that it might have happened much closer in earlier in the history of the solar system? Yeah, your intuition is absolutely correct. If you were to ask how long between collisions you know, with large objects as how may I go today, it would be much older than the age of the solar system. There's very little out there, and especially it has this very inclined orbit, so it doesn't encounter a lot of other objects. The time for a collision would have to have been very early in the solar system's evolution before the depletion of the Kuiper belt due to Neptune's migration. This is something that has been known for about 20 years now that the Kuiper belt originally had something like a thousand times more material than it has today. And Neptune was closer to the sun, but Neptune migrated outward and scattered a lot of these objects. And before that, they were all in these circular orbits around the sun in the orbital plane of the rest of the solar system. After Neptune migrated, then things were knocked into this uh, more inclined orbit like Haumea and its family members are in today. The story we've been promoting, we, we had a paper on this last year and put together a lot of the pieces, the collision that spun it up to high speed and probably knocked off some fragments probably happened during that early stage while Neptune was migrating out. And at that point, Haumea was stripped of some of its ice and it was spinning pretty fast. And then we believe it was scattered into this orbit. And then because it had continued to heat due to radioactivities inside of it, the rock in Haumea was able to go through the, the warmed and softened ice to form a, a rocky core in an icy mantle. And in doing so, it, it concentrated the mass at the center. And you know, just as an ice skater pulls her arms in and spins faster, Haumea actually spun faster and this flung off icy fragments that are these uh, family members, as we call them, that orbit the sun in the same way as Haumea today. And then about a billion years later, water, uh, the ice melted and formed water, and this water reacted with rock and made it clay-like and swelled up the core. So actually you put more mass far from the center and it spun down to its present day spin rate. So a little bit more complicated, but an exquisite test of the timing of all of these events in the early solar system. It also shows you, you know, illustrates very well how dynamic <laughs> even a small object like that was back in those days. Quite a lot happened to it. Now, any chance of ever uh, visiting it? Because that, that actually strikes me as one of the more interesting objects that we could ever visit because of the elongated nature of it and just seems like a really interesting object, especially if it's differentiated like that with, with so much water ice. And then you have to ask the question about life. I mean, could it have gotten a foothold while everything was melted? <laughs> you know, these types of questions. Any chance that we have the ability with coming rockets to actually go out and take a, a closer look at Kuiper Belt objects that, than we can do right now? Oh, I would love for a spacecraft to visit Haumea. Yeah, it's spinning very fast. And one of the things that I failed to mention was that it's spinning so fast, it's not even, it's not spherical. It's not even like a squash sphere. If you, if you add angular momentum to a sphere, it becomes a yeah. oblate spheroid. It's symmetrical about a rotation axis, but if you add more angular momentum to it, it actually becomes a triaxial ellipsoid, a sort of football shaped. And Haumea is the only example in the solar system of an object spinning so fast it looks like this. We predict from our models that it had liquid water in its interior for about a billion years. So you have basically one giant hot spring where you have hot water flowing past rock and minerals and able to react with them. There would have been a lot of ammonia in the mix, a lot of organic compounds. 
So it is not beyond question that, that you know, it, it could have had um, life or at least some primitive chemistry developed. It, it may be that some of these uh, compounds formed at the time erupted on the surface. Um, I said it was 97% at least water ice. But there are hints that there's this big red splotch on one side. So it would be absolutely fascinating um, object to visit with spacecraft. And whether it's possible, it's about the same distance as Pluto. So a New Horizons type mission could be conceived to go visit this object. It is daunting, though. You know, even New Horizons, the fastest spacecraft we've ever sent out into the solar system, still took nine years to get to Pluto. Now, prospects on the discovery of more large Kuiper Belt objects. Do you think we found them all, or do you think when we finally switch on the Vera Rubin Observatory and the LSST that we're going to find a lot more objects of that size and maybe even uh, that shape? It's a great question to ask, you know, how many big things are out there? We got into this whole kerfuffle about deciding whether Pluto is a planet or not because... Uh, a lot of large Kuiper Belt objects had been discovered in a row, and it seemed like we might see dozens and dozens more. But ever since then, we just didn't. And so the number of objects that we call dwarf planets today is it's just a handful. So uh, it is possible that there are some objects very far out. The process that ejected comets into our Oort cloud, where you have comets uh, with orbits as, as large as almost a light year, you know, kind of a fraction of the way to the nearest star. Jupiter would have scattered a lot of comets, but it would have also scattered Plutos and objects like that. And so it seems quite possible to me that there could be a number of Pluto-sized objects in our Oort cloud. Can't tell you how many, but I think we've discovered all of the ones that would be easy to find in the near future. What do you think uh, about the prospect of Planet Nine, that some of these objects out there have weird orbits that seem to have been affected by maybe another full-on planet? I don't want to demote Pluto, but for our purposes here, <laughs> Planet Nine, what do you think about that? Yeah, I'm very intrigued by this hypothesis, and there's uh, two tracks of thought about this, one involving the necessity of a Planet Nine to explain the planets, and then the other track just uh, assessing the plausibility of it. The plausibility is there. Uh, we know that our solar system made a lot more planets than remain in orbit close in, if you will, to the sun. Uh, a lot of the models of how the orbits of the giant planets, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, et cetera, have been affected. They, they really favor having another object that maybe is a few Earth masses in size that was ejected. It would certainly be plausible for Jupiter to eject something into a very large orbit around the sun. And I don't think any of us thinking about the evolution of the early solar system would be surprised if there was a few Earth mass object out there. The necessity of having one is a different story and the different groups are debating this because it, it comes down to seeing a lot of Kuiper Belt objects with their orbits sort of oriented on one side of the sun and not the other that could be explained by the, the shepherding effects of a, a giant uh, few Earth mass planet. But on the other hand, it could just be that the surveys have been subtly only sensitive to objects on one side of the sun. And it comes down to statistical arguments. And I'm not sure how I land on this. It is debated uh, heavily in the field right now. So it wouldn't be a surprise, but it also wouldn't be a surprise if it wasn't there. One sort of out there possibility, which is literally, I meant it literally, Kuiper Belt objects as possible ice shells, sort of like Europa's, but out in the uh, Kuiper Belt opening the way for life. Do you think that that is a, a viable thing? Do you think the radioactive decay in the cores of these things can keep liquid water going long term enough and still be there? Yes, uh, my models have tried to predict how long liquid water would persist in objects. And when we're talking about objects the size of Pluto's moon Charon or Haumea, Charon's mean radius is 600 kilometers, Haumea is 750. Those sorts of objects can keep liquid water for about a billion years in our models. But when you start getting into Pluto-sized objects, it seems quite feasible to have subsurface liquid even today. And so you'd have 
billions of years of liquid water, it's not due to tidal heating like Europa's ice shell and liquid ocean are due to, but but the radioactive heating of the rock is sufficient to maintain liquid water for a long time. So there's definitely the potential for astrobiology there. And it's kind of surprising, but there's more liquid water in the Kuiper Belt today than in Earth's oceans. Stepping further out from the Kuiper Belt, now objects obviously get ejected from star systems. In this case, even entire minor planets or even big planets get ejected and wander the cosmos in interstellar space. Does this also apply to them? In other words, can you have a situation of liquid water through radioactive decay and life on a rogue exoplanet wandering the cosmos? I think that's entirely possible to have a Pluto-sized object ejected entirely from the solar system. In fact, we are pretty sure that the Kuiper Belt contained uh, something like a thousand times more mass than it does today, and that, in fact, the Kuiper Belt had something on the order of 2,000 Plutos when it formed. And most of these were removed from the Kuiper Belt as Neptune migrated outward, and something like a fifth of them, so maybe 400 Plutos, might exist in the Oort cloud but another 1,600 are ejected from the solar system altogether and are just wandering through the galaxy. So it's certainly possible to have an icy planet like Pluto, and it would not have much on the surface, which would be at uh, you know, only a few degrees of absolute zero, but at depth, it's certainly possible to have liquid water and hydrothermal circulation and who knows what. This idea of interstellar wanderers. Now, with a Pluto-like object, and say it's it's been ejected and it's cooking along out in interstellar space, and then it hits something, <laughs> and the life that's in underneath the ice shell goes extinct with its own dinosaur-type extinction because it gets hit by something, and then something gets lifted off the surface. In other words, a sheet of nitrogen and mm. passes around, and then we might see that as certain objects such as what are your views on that? Yeah, so actually you don't have to wait for a Pluto to be ejected for pieces to come off. In fact, it's not going to hit anything out there, let's be honest. Uh, space is pretty empty. But during the early stages of the solar system, when uh, Neptune was migrating outward as it was depleting the Kuiper Belt, and you had all of these collisions, there would have been thousands of Plutos, each of them probably had nitrogen ice on their surfaces, the way Pluto today does. And uh, these collisions between Kuiper Belt objects as they're being scattered by Neptune would have generated uh, something like 10 to the 14 fragments, each of them maybe you know, 100 meters or less in size. We would have positively sandblasted the surfaces of thousands of Plutos and created just hundreds of trillions of fragments. And in the same way that the comets are ejected by Jupiter into an Oort cloud and into interstellar space, you would have done the same thing to all of these fragments. There would have been far more fragments ejected by Jupiter than comets themselves. And so to me, it's a, it's a very natural explanation to say that uh, Oumuamua, this, this interstellar visitor that came through our solar system in 2017, it very easily could be a fragment of uh, something ejected from the surface of, of a Pluto-like object, of course, around another star, not our star, but uh, since our solar system ejected so many nitrogen ice fragments, it makes sense that uh, there should be, uh, this should be a universal process and we should have encountered a nitrogen ice fragment from another solar system. Now, that has the virtue of explaining the, the needed outgassing to explain the slight acceleration that was observed with the object. So say that nitrogen is turning into gas and creates the rocket effect. Would we be, are we able to detect nitrogen? I mean, if we could do that observation over and obviously we can't because Oumuamua has gone, but if we could, would, would we be able to detect or from future objects like this, would we be able to detect the uh, nitrogen gas coming off of them? Right. I wish we had done the right observations when Oumuamua was in position to be observed. 
All we know is that, yes, there was something coming off of the surface because it got a slight push away from the sun. It got a push away from the sun that varied distance, like almost like a one over R squared effect. It's exactly akin to what comets experience because the water ice is being sublimated on the sunlit side and, and uh, ejecting off and just like a little rocket pushing off. Comets generally get a push that is something like 0.01% of the pull of gravity towards the sun. And in the case of Oumuamua, it got a push away from the sun that was 0.1% the pull of gravity, always in the same you know, radial direction away from the sun. So we're almost certain this is a, a sublimation of ice effect, but it can't be water ice. That would not give you sufficient push. And the Spitzer Space Telescope looked for water vapor, and we would have seen it if it had been there at the right amounts. We also know it couldn't have been carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. There was just a few gases that uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope looked for. We can place meaningful upper limits on because it did not see those gases. But we would not have observed nitrogen from the Spitzer Space Telescope, and it just doesn't really have infrared um, uh, features that Spitzer could observe. It might have been possible to see nitrogen N2 in the optical wavelengths, although this object was not very big and there would have been not really enough nitrogen gas to look for. But in theory, it should be possible to look for ionized N2 gas coming off of an object like this if you, if you had a, a powerful optical telescope looking at the right time. That we saw this object at all suggests that, just with pan stars, suggests that it's probably from a population of like objects, however many that may be and however often. So there is hope that we might see another object like this spraying off nitrogen, right? Yeah, absolutely. If we, you know, have the PanSTARRS array operational for about five years and we see an object, it would be incredibly coincidental to not see more like this. And the hope is that Vera Rubin will, the observatory will see many more of these objects. It's, it's hard to know exactly what the statistics will show, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was about one such object per year. And then it would be a lot more feasible to follow up with a, a lot of different types of observations if, if we knew they were coming. Now, my last question for you is about another paper that you authored, Revising the Age of the Solar System. It turned out to be a little bit older than we thought. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we have been, Meteoriticists, the community, has been using the uranium-lead dating system to figure out when different objects in meteorites formed. And I've mentioned chondrules, which are melted spherules of uh, silicate rock. Each one of them was melted while floating through space in this gas and dust disk around the solar system. And calcium aluminum rich inclusions, or CAIs, which seem to have formed from minerals that condensed out of a, a hot and early stage of the nebula. And by looking at the measuring the isotopes of lead and uranium, you can figure out how long ago these objects formed. Well, one of the things that has been said is that the lead lead age of CAIs, which is four, five, six, seven point three million years, is the age of the solar system because CAIs are supposed to be the first things to form. And in this recent study, we did not rely on CAIs as, as a way of determining the ages. We actually think CAIs are too small and a little bit too unpredictable to faithfully record the age of the solar system. So we actually asked, if you were to measure the uranium-led ages of large melted meteorites, so meteorites from melted asteroids, these uh, melted and recrystallized rocky things are called achondrites, and by measuring the lead lead ages of anchondrites and comparing them to the times of formation you'd infer from other radioactive elements, aluminum 26 decays to magnesium 26 with a half-life of 700,000 years, uh, manganese 53 decays uh, with a millions of years half-life, um, happening 182. By comparing all of these different ways of measuring ages, 
and comparing them to the lead lead age, we can ask, is there a single age of the solar system that, that makes all of those timescales work together and be concordant? We found that, yeah, there is an age and it's four, five, six, eight point four plus or minus 0.2 million years. So that is what we infer is the, the age of the solar system. But of course it conflicts with the CAI age. So we went back and asked, what's going on with the CAI ages? And uh, one thing is that we, we just don't think that they're faithfully recording that time because they may have formed at an early time at four, five, six, eight point four million years ago, but then being reset. So if something heated them up, heated them up to the point where lead isotopes could move around, but not quite so hot as to melt the CAIs, we would recognize that. But if they got up to temperatures that didn't melt them, but did mobilize the lead isotopes, then you would, in essence, reset the lead lead uh, clock in those inclusions. And we actually compute whether that's possible and find that, yeah, that's not only possible, <laughs> it's a really good chance. There's only been about, depending on how you count, one to four CAIs ever measured for their lead lead ages, and only one where you can test whether it was reset. And that one actually kind of looks reset. So a lot of stuff came together for us. It looks like people have been relying on CAIs to tell us the age of the solar system, but even though they formed at the beginning of the solar system, their lead lead clock can be reset later. Instead, you should use these big achondrites with multiple isotopic systems. And we find that, yeah, they're concordant and if the age of the solar system is about a million years older than we thought. All right, Doctor, thanks for joining us today. And I look forward to reading future papers and best of luck in your research. And I hope you'll come back sometime and we'll talk even more. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science John, Fiction Author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction Author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing. And be sure. And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Sell out. What? <laughs>